Okay, welcome back to the Sliding Book of Genesis. In the beginning, um, before I start, I'm going to say a uh, short personal prayer. Okay, Genesis, we're in chapter, chapter 5. Hallelujah. All right, let's jump right in. Genesis 5.1. Okay, Genesis 5, 1, and it reads, This is the book of the generations of Adam, and the day that Elohim created man, and the likeness of Elohim made he him. Okay, this uh, word generations here is oftentimes thought of as genealogy, and I used to think of it as genealogy as well, you know, but um, not so, not, not completely. Uh, the word is toledah. Um, number 8435, meaning to uh, a descent, descendants, results, account of men and their descendants. You know, and this is essentially, you know, what it is. It's, it's an account, you know, of men and their descendants more so than it is a genealogy. For as you begin to go through and you see where this, uh, these generations or these talado as they're, as they're called you know occur in Genesis you'll see that it speaks to more than just the genealogy and if it was a truly a genealogy you'll, you'll notice that there's a whole lot of gaps within this genealogy if it was a genealogy but it, it in fact isn't a genealogy it's very interesting you know in our actuality because it's believed that these were ancient books you know that the talado was actually ancient books, and that when you you see that it, um, that these ancient books was passed down throughout the generations, you know, thereby making you know some of the oldest writings uh, or the oldest writings uh, in humanity in the history of humanity because they start started with the beginning of humanity, you know, and if you take note. In Genesis 5, when it says this, this book of the generations of Adam, you know, uh, this book of the account of Adam, you know, some people say, you know, then you get into who wrote Genesis, you know, and the theory of the teledote is the people that are entailed within it actually wrote it, you know, with, uh, we have with Adam, you know, like here, we, we notice that there's, cert, there's a certain characteristic format within these teledotes. There's 11 that, that's in the book of Genesis. And part of this characteristic format is, number one, the record begins straight away, that is, without a title. Yet, in fact, the tablet may be referred to by its opening words. You know, we see something like that, like with the book of Le Leviticus, you know, um, which means, and he called. Okay, uh, it's the first couple words, you know, that's that uh, of the book, and so that's what it's, it became referred to by. You know, we also uh, number two, you know, with these teledote, we see that each tablet ends with a teledote statement referring to what has been written above, not below. See, a lot of people, um, you know, uh, look at this at in a category. Uh, manner meaning that it's speaking to what's coming after this, you know. So actually, when it says this book of the generations of Adam, this is kind of like, uh, <laughs> you know, his signature, his signing off on everything that preceded it, you know, not what's coming afterwards. Um, third characteristic um, of these teledotes: a name in the teledote statement refers either to the writer or to the owner of the tablet. So. Here it is, uh, we're told that th this is the account of Adam, you know, and that would refer to the tablet belonging to Adam or even written by Adam. You know, so uh, that's 
you know, I wanted to introduce you to the concept of the tele teledote um, because there's, you know, there's there's a lot of stuff floating around out there, and it's a lot of folks that say, you know, well, you know, these writings are older than these writings, so this come from that and that sort of thing, you know, uh, it, but not so. Not so. It is also believed that everything on a tablet must have been uh, known by the, the writer or the owner. So, you know, whoever owned the tablet, whoever wrote the type tablet, you know, they had firsthand knowledge as to the things that transpired, you know, within that tablet. You know, thus the info in each teledopa genesis should represent the conditions that ended before the death of the person named in the record. You know, so as we see here with uh, the book or the writings of the account of Adam. And so this was passed down, you know, throughout, throughout the generations and ultimately this is how we got scripture. You know, folks was writing stuff down, you know, and I, something that, that was particularly interesting, you know, to me anyhow, you know, uh, was how they would copy, how they would copy these tablets. You know, um, you know, they would uh, sketch these these tablets in with like a, a stick or or a piece of metal, and that's what what they would write into these wet wet tablets, these clay tablets. With you know, and then they would either let them sun dry or they'll put them in the oven and bake them. You know, okay, and they would like actually string these tablets together. You know, you can see how they could put holes in them and then they could actually string them together, you know. Um, now, when it came to copying a tablet, you know, um, what they would do is they would take that tablet that they had inscribed, that they done baked in the oven or sun dried, and then they would take another wet tablet and they'll just take that one and they'll put it, you know, on the wet tablet. And that will give like a mirror image of the tablet, you know. now you're familiar with mirror images is actually backwards, you know. <laughs> you know, so what they would do is they would dry that tablet and then they'll do it again with a third tablet and put it on top of that one and then it'll straighten it back out. And there you have the world's first copying machine. <laughs> you know, so, you know, that's how they would copy these tablets. And, and um, these are, these tablets are, Many, 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 many of them have been found, you know, throughout the um, generations by archaeologists. They found, you know, such tablets as I'm speaking of, you know. So, and that dates way back to antiquity, you know. So, you know, this is, this is, uh, you know, wasn't, you know, exclusive to, to uh, the descendants of uh, just Adam in and of himself. But, you know, as, as time progressed, you know, many people were, um, writing things down and they were copying it in this manner, you know, so I wanted to throw that out there, at least make you aware of the teledote, you know, and what that's all about and, and how, you know, Moshe could have just uh, been the one to copy these things, you know, where all these books were carried, you know, and passed down throughout the generations, you know, he could have, y'all could have just used him to copy them and to preserve them, you know, more so than, you know, how some people will say, well, you know, he just, you know, told Moshe everything to write. You know, uh, the teledote seems to speak differently. It seems to speak to, to people who were given, given the, telling these accounts of what transpired in their lifetime you know, and passing it down, you know, to the next generation that they might have an account of history, you know, in their family line. Okay, uh, Genesis 5, 2 says, male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day they were created. You know, and Adam speaks to, you know, his, his name speaks to a man. You know, for it tells us right there in verse 1, in that day Elohim created man, you know, and he created man and he called him Adam. So Adam equals man. You know, so here, here it is. We see he created a male and female, created them and blessed them. And also take note that, you know, they, 
both were called by the name of the man. You know, he didn't say, and he called their name Adam and Eve. You know, and, and so it is throughout Scripture. A lot of times when, even when it refers, it just refers to the man, it actually means the wife too. It, it means the wife as well. She didn't get left out, as some, some think, you know, but it actually refers to both of them because, you know, they were viewed as one. And besides, it was hard to do all that writing back then. <laughs> all right, Genesis 5, 3. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. And Seth, his name can mean compensation. It can mean substituted, set, put or fixed, foundation, or appointed. You know, and so it is. Adam lived 130 years, and he begot a son in his own likeness after his image, called his name Seth. You know, now when it speaks, speaks of in his likeness and his image, it's not talking about the likeness and image of Elohim. Because, you know, once he sinned, he was no longer like Elohim, because Elohim is without sin. Amen? You know, so once he sinned, he was no longer like Elohim, so he begot a son in his likeness and after his image. You know, hence, um, we, we read in agreement to this, Romans 5, uh, verses 12 through 17, it says, Wherefore, as one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, Death reigned from Adam to Moshe, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense one of one many be dead, much more the grace of Elohim and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Yahushua Mashiach, have abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift for judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one much more, they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Yahushua Mashiach. You know, so, you know, again, speaking to when he bore, uh, begot, Self, it was in his likeness and image and not the likeness and image of Elohim. Amen? Mm -hmm. All right, let me have my first reader read Genesis 5, 4 through 8, please. In the days of Adam, after he had begotten Seth for 800 years, and he begot sons and daughters, and all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. And Seth lived an hundred and five years, and begat Enos. And Seth lived after he begat Enos eight hundred and seven years, and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Seth were nine hundred and twelve years, and he died. Hallelujah. Now, we have a new player into the, into the uh, account, and this is Enos. And, well, we got introduced to him last week, but... Uh, he's new in chapter 5 and his name means man mortal, speaks to a mortal speaks to um, someone man in the sense of being mortal I should say you know, his name um, speaks to a man in the sense of being mortal to one being feeble, frail, or sick you know, so uh, kind of tells you what kind of guy he was, huh you know, so let me have my next reader read verses 9 through 14, please. And Enos lived 90 years and begat Canaan. And Enos lived after he begat Canaan 850 years and begat sons and daughters. A nest at Canaan, a nest as fixed processor, very sorrow. Okay. And all the days of Enos were 905 years and he died. And Canaan lived 70 years and begat Mahalalel. Yeah, that's good. And Canaan lived after he begat Mahalalel 840 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Canaan were 910 years and he died. 
Okay, so we have Canaan, who means, you know, means a nest, or a nest as fixed, you know, as, you know, you see a net, nest that's fixed in a tree, you know, so his name means it's a nest that's fixed, or a possessor, or a dirge, or sorrow. Uh, and then we have Mahalalil, whose name means the praise of Elohim. Hallelujah, that's a good name, huh? You know, and uh, actually, I think, you know, he's the first guy with with um, Elohim in his name, you know, ever, like in the history of humanity, <laughs> you know. Let me have my next reader read uh, Genesis 5, 15 through 20. And Mahal Mahalalel lived 60 and 5 years and begat Jared. And Mahalalel lived after he begat Jared 830 30 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Mahalalel were 890 and five years, and he died. And Jared lived 100 years, 160 and two years, and he begat Enoch. And Jared lived after he begat Enoch 800 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 960 and two years, and he died. Hallelujah. Y'all sure knew how to populate the earth, didn't you? You know, folks living 900 and some years, you know, they have an opportunity to make a lot of babies. <laughs> you know. All right. Uh, oh, I didn't go over. Uh, Jared. Jared, his name means... To a, a descent or to descend or shall come down. And then we have Enoch. You know, Enoch, very special character in scripture. You know, uh, he's the seventh from Adam. His name means rest, dedicated, disciplined, consecrated, speaks um, teaching uh, to initiate or commence a narrow, to initiate or commence a narrow. I thought that was strange. Uh, but anyway, you know, so uh, I thought I put something in there concerning Enoch. Oh, I did. Um, let me have a next, next reader read verses 21 through 24. And Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with Elohim after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with Elohim, and he was not for Elohim. And he was not for Elohim took him. Thank you. You know, Enoch was a very special individual. You know, he was, uh, he was a prophet of Elohim. We um we even told that in the Brick Kadashah in Jude 114 and 15. It says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Adonai cometh with tens thousands, ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. You know, so... Um, Enoch was was a uh, was a prophet, and you know, and there's a couple books attributed it to him, and um, just a uh, very interesting fellow in scripture altogether. As we see here, you know, when he was 65, he begot Methuselah. Methuselah would would come to be the oldest man that ever walked the earth. You know, he lived the longest. Uh, and his days, uh, does it tell us how long he lived? I believe it's 969 years. You know, um, it tells us that somewhere. But uh, he lived to be 969 years. And his name actually, you know, can mean the man of the dark or the man of the javelin. Um, his name can also mean he dies and it is sent, or his death shall bring forth. And which is amazing because, you know, Enoch named his son because... Obviously, because, um, you know, when you know the story, is obvious, but, you know, because of something he had learned from, of Yah, and that was that Yah was going to destroy humanity with a flood, you know, and Methuselah's name is actually a prophecy 
concerning that flood coming. After his death, or his death shall bring forth. You know, his death shall bring forth the flood. You know, and it wasn't until after the death of Methuselah, you know, that the flood came. But the awesome thing in all this is, you know, Methuselah, as, as aforementioned, was the oldest living individual that ever walked the earth. He lived the longest out of everyone. And that just shows you the grace and mercy of Elohim. You know, that he, that he waited the longest period before he destroyed the earth. And likewise, you know, um, even, you know, we know that the earth is going to be destroyed once again. You know, but this time, not with water, but by fire. But he's going to wait until Methuselah dies again. He's going to wait the longest time before he does it. That longest time is drawing nigh. Amen? Amen. You know, in fact, today, it is one day closer than it was yesterday. Amen. Absolutely. This year is one year closer than it was last year. So, it's coming. We're getting closer each day. You know, Methuselah, he's going to die one of these days, and that fire is going to come forth. Spiritually speaking, of course. You know, so I thought that was just Yasum, uh, uh, a Yasum show of Yah's grace and mercy, though, that he chose, okay, if it's got to be after a man's life um, lifespan, I'm going to choose the oldest guy that ever lived. You know, just show you how, how great Yah is. And how he desires not none of his people to, to perish. And it says that Enoch walked with Elohim for 300 years. You know, and he was not for Elohim took him well, where did he take them? Well, I don't know. It doesn't tell us. You know, but he was not. For Elohim took him. You know, he was a very special individual. You know, and and you know, and this is this is a testament to him. You know, to his faith walking, to his walking with Elohim. You know, he was he was quite a guy. We we see another guy that's similar to him in Scripture, Eliyahu. Or Elijah, who also uh, was taken. We know he was taken up in the whirlwind. But, you know, there's not very many of them. There were only two that Scripture speaks of that was taken. Let me have my next read, read verses 25 through 29 of Genesis 5. And Methuselah lived 187 years and begat Lemuth. And Methuselah lived after and begot Lamech after, or excuse me, 780 and two years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Methuselah were 960 and nine years, and he died. And Lamech lived 180 and two years and begot a son. And he called his name Noah, saying, this same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which Yahuwah has cursed. Hallelujah. Thank you. So we have Lamech. Lamech name means powerful, brought low, despairing. And then we have Noah introduced here. Everybody remember Noah, right? Yeah. You know, his name means rest, comfort, yeah. consolation. We have our next reader read verses 30 through 32, please. And Lamech lived after he begat Noah 590 and five years, and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Lamech were 770 and seven years, and he died. And Noah was 500 years old when he, Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Okay, I forgot to embolden in that. Um, but that's an, a, another, was another really big sign. You know, uh, Lamech lived after he begot Noah 595 years and got sons and daughters, and all the days of Lamech was 770 and 7. 
you have seven, seven, seven. How about that? You know. And uh, you know, when you when you look in um, in Revelations, you also see, you know, in the end of time, you know, at the end of time there will be a series of sevens that come forth. Amen. You know, uh, I think that's more than just a coincidence. But it says that Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Yaphet. You know, and Yaphet, his name means expansion or opened or enlargement or let him spread out. Then we have Shem, his name means name. How about that? <laughs> you know, or renown. And then we have Ham or Ham or however you on there. Hum, yeah. Uh, yeah, him. His, his name means hot, sunburnt, or brown. Okay, so there so happens to be a hidden message entailed within the names of those from Adam to Noah. When we string those names out, it tells us a tale. Actually, it tells us a prophecy. It says, um, when we put them together, it reads, it says, man appointed, or man appointed morality, uh, I should have put the little um, ises and stuff in there. But man is appointed to morality, feebleness, sickness as a nest. The praise of Elohim shall come down, uh, consecrated, dedicated, disciplined, teaching a rest, initiating or commencing a narrowing. His death shall bring forth the powerful brought low. Uh, uh, to comfort or consolation or rest. Now, let's take a closer look at this. It speaks of man being appointed to mor mortality or feebleness or sickness as a nest. In other words, man is appointed to live in a state of mortality. You know, we know the Messiah, he's trying to, you know, give us the gift of immortality. Amen? So that we no longer have Mortality. We'll no longer suffer. We'll no longer feel pain. We'll no more have sorrow. Okay, mm -hmm. you know. But here it is. There's a prophecy speaking that man is appointed to mortality, appointed to being feeble, appointed to being sick, as a nest. That is, as a as a place to live. That man will live in in mortality, <laughs> and live in feebleness and sickness. You know. And it speaks of the praise of Elohim shall come down. Well, we know who the praise of Elohim is, right? Even our Messiah, Yahushua. The praise of Elohim shall come down. He shall be consecrated, dedicated, disciplined, teaching a rest, initiating and commencing a narrowing. And his death shall bring forth the powerful that has been brought low, comfort, consolation, and rest. You know, this is not what scripture teaches us concerning our Messiah. You know, now, it's, I want to zero in on this part about the praise of Elohim coming down, consecrated. Because Yahshua was consecrated, you know, to Elohim. He was dedicated to Elohim. He was very disciplined, was he not? Mm -hmm. He was a teacher. He did come teaching. He taught of a rest that, that is to come. Mm -hmm. Even a thousand year millennium reign. He initiated, and this is, this is, this is really the crux of the matter that I want to speak to today. He initiated a commencing, initiated or commenced a narrowing. And his death brought forth the, to the powerful that was brought low. That is the Yahudim and, Yit, and the um, nation of Israel. It brought them comfort, consolation, and rest, knowing that, you know, we're going to be risen even as he was risen. Amen? Amen. You know, but I want to speak a little bit about what he initiated, because he did come consecrated to Elohim, dedicated and disciplined and teaching about a rest to come and teaching about how we will be consoled in the last, in the, um, at the end of time, you know, in him, if we remain in him. Mm -hmm. But he also initiated or commenced a narrowing. What does it mean? What does a narrowing mean? Now, this word narrowing, can be compared to one choking themselves with a rope to death. You know, which sounds really bizarre when you think about the Messiah, you know, he initiated or commenced a narrow. He commenced a way 
that can be compared to one choking themselves to death with a rope. That is, you know, the more that you that you uh, hang on that rope, the tighter it gets. You know, but this is likened unto what the Messiah actually initiated, the way that he initiated, the way that he commenced. You know, because when you think about it, this is exactly what he did when he came to the earth. You know, he followed a narrowing, he initiated a narrowing, a way of life that led to his death. Did, it not, did he not? Let's take a look at Matthew Yahoo 7, 13 and 14. It says, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find. Now, again, the prophecy said that he would initiate or commence a narrowing. Now, the, we hear, have here the Messiah speaking of a narrowing, a way that is narrow. You know, but we seen what this word narrowing is compared to even one choking themselves with a rope. Let's see unto death. Let's see what this word narrow that Yahshua uses here. Let's see how it relates. The word narrow here is uh, Thalibo. Thalibo, number 2346, it means to crowd, to rub, to afflict, to throne, to suffer tribulation, to trouble. Sounds pretty similar to me, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, Let's take, we're going to take a look at some of the other places in which this word flebo is, is used. In Hebrews 11, 37 through 39, we read, They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all have obtained a good report through faith. Receive not the promise. And he's talking about the saints of, of old. You know, that's, that's who he's referring to, the saints of old. You know, this is what they went through. You know, and it speaks of them having that narrowing. This word afflicted here is the same word. That's translated as narrow, narrow, feeble, number 2346. Also, we see it used in 2 Corinthians 7, 4, and 5 that speak to this narrowing way. You know, it says, great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. For when we were come to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without, uh, without were fightings, and within were fears. Again, can you see this narrow way within this? Yeah. This narrowing? This word troubled here is plebo, number 2346 again. Also, let's take a look at how it's used in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 11. It says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of Elohim and not of us. We are troubled on every side. That word troubled is Lebo, number 2346, that narrowing. We are narrowed on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body of dying of the Adonai Yahushua, that the life also of Yahushua might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Yahushua's sake, that the life also of Yahushua might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So again, can you see the narrowing? Can you see the narrow way? Also, 1 Thessalonians 3, 4 through 5. That no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we, were, we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer 
tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. To suffer tribulation is the same word, flebo, number 2346. Can you see the way of the righteous is a narrow way? The way that the Messiah commenced is a narrow way. He did initiate and commence a narrowing, a narrowing way to life. Now, I propose, many of you, like unto the two billion plus quote unquote Christians, have taken the Romans road to salvation. Yet I'm trying to show you another way that's less travel. I'm trying to show you a narrowing way that our Messiah spoke of. I'm trying to show you a narrowing way that was prophesied even here in Genesis within the meaning of these names of those who would receive everlasting life, of those in whom he came to bring that comfort and consolation. Truly, they are powerful people that's brought low. But they will receive comfort and consolation. Again, man that is appointed to mortality, feebleness, sickness, as a nest. Yes, we're appointed to live in these feeble bodies that, that suffer with sickness, that are feeble. We're appointed to live within these, these, these temples, these, these fleshly bodies as a nest. But the praise of Elohim, he has come down. And he was consecrated. He was dedicated. He was disciplined. And he did teach us the ways of Elohim. He taught us the righteousness of Elohim. He initiated and commenced a narrowing way that leadeth unto life. And his death did bring forth the powerful that was brought low. And he does have a, com a comfort and a consolation and a rest for us to enter into, even now today. You know, again, Luke 13, 23 through 25, then said one, uh, one unto them, one unto him, Adonai, are there a few that be saved? And he said unto them, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and has shut to the door, and ye begin to stand without and knock at the door, saying, Adonai, Adonai, open unto us, he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not. Whence are ye? That's serious. That's real serious. You know, also, Matthew Yahoo 7, 13 and 14, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. The way unto life is a narrow way. That narrow way speaks to persecution. It speaks to something that gets tighter and tighter as you go along. Yeah. You know, and it says, and few there be that find it. Let's define um, these, these two terms, many and few, because we're told in Luke 13, 23, the question is asked, are there few that be saved? What was he talking about, a few? You know, because sometimes, you know, their words can mean a little something different than, than what we understand a, a few to be and a many to be. Well, this word many is polos or pools. Uh, polos number 4183 meaning largely, mostly all. And this word few is oligos number 3641 meaning puny or small or little. So let's take another look at this. You know, 1323 of Luke says, then said one unto him, Adonai, are there few that be saved? Are there a puny amount that be saved? Are there a little or small amount that be saved? And he said, strive to enter in at the straight gate. This word strive means to wrestle, to fight. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you have to fight 
to get through this straight gate. Yes. You know, now, now take heed to what he says. He said, fight, why? Why fight, Messiah? Why fight, Pastor? He says, for many I say unto you will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Mm -hmm. So you see, to even get through the gate that lead us unto life, we have to fight. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yeah. We have to fight to enter in the straight gate. Why? Why, Messiah? For many, that is, for mostly all, for mostly all I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Mm -hmm. That's huge. Mostly all will seek to enter in and not be able. You know, now, we're told in verse 14 of Matthew 7 that there's only a few that find the straight gate. There's only a puny amount that even find the straight gate. There's only a small or a little amount that even find the straight gate. Now, there's, I have you know there's only about... Six billion people on the planet. And two billion plus claim to be quote unquote Christians. <coughs> that flies in the face of what this passage is saying, does it not? Yeah. Two billion plus by no standard is a few. <laughs> Amen? We're talking about over a third of the earth's population. That doesn't sound like a few to me. That doesn't sound puny or small or little. Something's wrong. That's what it sounds like to me. It sounds like something's wrong. Maybe someone should take another look at this Roman's road to salvation. Maybe we should be trying to find that straight gate and that narrow way which lead us unto life. Because this broad gate, this wide gate and this broad way that lead us unto destruction, that's where most of the people are. So if this is how you became saved, then maybe you want to turn around while it's still time. I'm just saying. You know, that don't sound like a few. You know, and we're told here that it's only a few, only a puny, only a little amount of people that are even going to find the gate. Now, once you find it, you still got to fight to enter in. And then once you get in, you still got to walk the narrow way. Can you see, can you see, see this? Can you see what this walk really is supposed to look like? I pray that you can. Because it's not, it's not what's being purported. It's not what's being propagated. You don't hear too many people talking about this. See, the narrow way that our Messiah commenced, that he initiated, is a way that starts with Torah and finishes with the commandments of Yahshua. That's what this way looks like. But if you truly walk this thing out properly, then it's going to get narrower and narrower as you go. Even to the point where it can be compared to a rope getting tighter and tighter around your neck. Hence, the Messiah would say, pick up your torture stake and follow me. You know, when you think of it in that context, it makes perfect sense. This is why he says, pick up your torture stake and follow me. Because this walk is torturous mm -hmm. unto the flesh. It kills the flesh. But the spirit of Elohim quickened them. Our spirits unto life. The spiritual being within us, the one that's fathered from above, i.e. the one that's born again. That's the one that will enter into the promised land. That's the one that will enter into New Jerusalem. 
That's the one that will receive everlasting life. This fleshly nest, as Genesis 5 put it, this mortal, feeble, sick nest that we live in now must die. You know, so, you know, this is just, it don't get no bigger than this. The message don't get no, no larger than this. You know, this is, this is as big as it gets. Because this is the difference between life and death. There's two ways. And if you adhere to scripture and you look at what's being done, Within quote unquote Christianity, you can see two ways. You can see the wide gate and the broad way, can you not? Yeah. And you can see the narrowing way. One of them is right, and it's the one that only a few find. I pray that. I helped you at least get to the gate today. That's all I have for you. Pray it was a blessing to you.